Hello and welcome to today's mental health data webinar. Now, our kind of plan for today, we promise we'll be finished by 3 o'clock. I'm going to talk first. I'm Sally McManus. I'm based at the National Centre for Social Research. And I'm going to talk about a range of different cross-sectional surveys, but focusing on specialist mental health surveys. And I'll also say a bit about the Longitudinal Understanding Society survey. Then Owen McElroy from Leicester University is going to talk about the birth cohort studies for about 20 minutes. And then we should have about 15 minutes, which is going to be facilitated by Sarah king Heal, who is of the UK Data Service, who's organized this whole webinar. Um, but if you have questions as you go through, you'll see the panel on the right-hand side. There should be a box where you can key in questions. So as we're going through, while we can't take the questions um, as we go through, we will have that time at the end to go through them. And if there are any questions that we don't get to, we can see who's asked the questions and so we can email you later and do our best to answer that way as well. Okay, so today is part of a series of webinars. Uh, the other webinars in the series are focusing on things like political behavior, religion, and languages being spoken. And those webinars are going to be taking place uh, in the new year. So keep a lookout for that. But today we're going to be focusing on primarily different types of survey data which we can use to understand mental health. Now, a good place to start when you're looking for new data is, of course, the UK Data Service's own website, and the website address is there. And we're incredibly fortunate in the UK to have the UK Data Service, which has been running for many decades and brings together survey data from across a range of different sources and a range of different topics. Now, whilst I'm going to be focusing for the first 20 minutes now around the specialist mental health surveys, in particular the adult psychiatric morbidity survey series, there are a series of other types of surveys that you can access through the UK Data Service which may well be more relevant to the research questions that you have. Now the general health surveys are a key resource and they're often run every year for many years. The Health Survey for England, for example, includes the uh, GHQ-12, so it's a very useful resource if you want to look at trends in mental health. The Attitudinal Surveys can also be a really useful resource. Both the British Social Attitudes Survey and the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey have included modules in particular years that are focused on things like attitudes towards mental illness and attitudes towards things like talking therapies and treatments. Finally, while our focus today is not really on subjective well-being measures. It is um, an available data source to you that things like the annual population survey and the crime survey for England, which have phenomenally large uh, sample sizes, have over the last decade included uh, things like the Warwick Edinburgh measure or the ONS4. So they'll often include uh, information on uh, whether or not people have been, experienced anxiety yesterday, how happy they were yesterday. So you've got those sorts of effective subjective measures included on that. But mainly today, I wanted to talk about the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, which is a terribly named survey, and I do apologize for its name. Um, the turquoise squares that you see on this timeline here, APMS, that stands for the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, they've been carried out every seven years since 1993. Um, so you've got four major surveys there that are available for secondary analysis. Now, the yellow squares on the screen there refer to the Mental Health of Children and Young People survey, which I'm not going to talk about so much today, but is also an available resource uh, which follows a very similar approach to that taken on the adult surveys, but using different screening tools. Now, the survey series is funded by the Department of Health, and the two most recent surveys were commissioned by NHS Digital. As I said, it's a series of repeated cross-sectional surveys carried out in 93, 2000, 2007, 2014, which actually makes it the longest-running mental health survey series of its kind in the world to use consistent measures over time. This is a probability sample, um, so it's a high-quality general population sample drawn from the household population, usually about seven to 8,000 adults in each wave. 
Interviews take place in people's own homes and quite substantial, lasting about an hour and a half. Now, what makes the survey series distinct and distinctive is that the assessment of mental disorder is done approximating uh, the diagnostic criteria that are used in the standard manuals. So what this means is that rather than just having a simple screening tool, like um, the GHQ-12 is great, but it just is a measure of generalized psychiatric distress. Whereas on the mental health surveys, we use the clinical entity schedule revised, which is a um, much more rigorous uh, approach. It has a about 130 questions covering 14 different types of neurotic symptoms and for each of these symptoms it asks about its presence in the last seven days, uh, how many times, uh, the severity, uh, the length, the duration of symptoms. So a very detailed amount of information is collected. We then apply algorithms to that data and we can produce six different types of common mental disorder. And we can also produce, which would be very useful um, in a lot of the secondary analyses that you might be planning, uh, a dimensional severity score, which is called the, the CISR score, um, and which could be very useful if you uh, need a continuous outcome measure. Now, Owen, shortly, will be talking about the beautiful cohort surveys, and those cohort studies are wonderful for understanding change across the life course and are ideal for starting to disentangle some of the cause and effect. However, repeated cross-sectional surveys are better for some kinds of research questions. So for the sorts of research question which you might want to use APMS data, after looking at population prevalence, so because these haven't suffered from attrition in the same way that, say, a cohort study might. It's much better for looking at prevalence in the population, and it also covers the whole household population. So it can tell us about how much of something there is, and because we have repeated cross-sectional surveys that use broadly the same methods, it can tell us about temporal changes over time. Now, all of the surveys that we're talking about today will be really powerful resources for looking at treatment gaps, where we have information collected about what treatment people are accessing and what symptoms are present. Also, the surveys collect really rich information that enables us to identify different subgroups and enables us to look at inequalities and in circumstances. So what I'm going to do over the next sort of five, ten minutes is talk about examples, worked examples, of where we've used the mental health data to answer some of these sorts of um, research questions. So firstly, around population prevalence. Um, this is a short paper that we put together recently where we wanted really to disentangle what do we mean when we talk about population prevalence in mental disorder. And we wanted to show that this really depends on the types of disorders that you're measuring and the severity level and uh, uh, time frame in which they're measured. So if we take, for example, a very rare condition, a very severe condition such as the experience of psychosis or psychotic episode in the past year, then we're going to achieve prevalence of around 1 in 100. But if we add into that group those who've experienced severe anxiety and depression at a level at which we would certainly consider treatment to be warranted, then we're looking more like a prevalence of around 1 in 10. And if we add in those who are experiencing any kind of anxiety and depression at a level likely to be clinically relevant, if not necessarily warranting intervention, we're getting to more like one in five. And of course, substance dependence is another area of mental disorder that can be considered, which includes things like alcohol dependence and drug dependence. And then if we add into our pot those experiencing some sorts of neurodevelopmental disorders like um, ADHD, then we can certainly identify more than one in four in the population likely to be affected. So alongside examining different disorders uh, to diagnostic criteria, the beauty of the specialist mental health surveys is that they cover a range of different types of mental health indicators. So you might want to base an entire study on any one of these, or you might want to look at the relationships between different types of disorders. So the data is ideal for exploring comorbidity in this way. 
Now, as I said, we have a series of repeated cross-sectional surveys, and we've tried very hard to keep the, um, the approach taken in each survey uh, comparable. So this is an example of where we've used the survey series to look at uh, temporal trends over time in the proportion of the population reporting having self-harmed. Now, the things to bear in mind when you're using the mental health survey series to look at temporal trends is that you do need to check that the question or the measure being used is consistent. And there's always a trade-off uh, within the survey team that we want to keep the measure consistent, but we also want to use the measure that's meaningful in a contemporary setting. So it's always what you need to you need to keep an eye on that. The other thing is to check that you're looking at a consistently defined sample. So when we were looking at temporal trends and self-harming, we had to exclude the data from the 1993 survey because there self-harming was only asked of people who'd expressed depressive ideas. You'd also need to check about consistency in mode. So with this paper here, looking at trends in self-harm, we've always asked about self-harm face-to-face, -face, but in the more recent surveys, we've also asked about self-harming in the self-completion part of the interview. But because reporting is higher in the self-completion, we had to not use that information when constructing temporal trends. The other things to bear in mind are ensuring that we have a consistently defined sample in terms of geographical cover. So the earlier surveys in the series covered all of Britain, so Scotland and Wales as well, whereas the two most recent surveys covered England only. The age group has also changed. In 93, went up to age 64, in 2000, up to 74. And in the more recent surveys, um, we had no upper age limit. So this is some of the results that we published in that paper. It shows a steep increase in the proportion of the population reporting that they were using self-harming as a coping strategy. The chart on the left shows for men and on right for women. And we can see that the increase has been steeper in more recent years amongst women. So the other sorts of things that we can use survey data for in this way are to look at the treatment gap. So that is, amongst people who have symptoms of a disorder, what proportion are receiving treatment and are there inequalities in that? What this chart here shows is the proportion of people reporting that they've ever self-harmed, saying that they have received medical or psychological support as a result of that self-harming. We can see that at least half of people don't go on to receive medical or psychological support. We can also um, do regression analyses to look at the characteristics that predict not getting support. And we found that if you're relying on treatment data, you might want to be aware that younger people, men, and those in debt who had self-harmed were less likely to receive treatment as a, support, as a result. OK, and then the final sorts of questions that you might want to use the Mental Health Survey Series to address are around exploring differences between groups. So, on the surveys, a wide range of different characteristics and contexts of respondents are asked about. These are some of the different um, uh, things that we ask people about. So you could base the paper on any one of these topics. Um, in this paper, what we did was we looked at the data we had that enabled us to identify whether or not people were students or not students. And we focused in on uh, 16 to 24 year olds. And this chart shows amongst men the proportion of students and uh, not students who reported um, or who met the criteria for a common mental disorder, such as an anxiety or depression disorder. And we're not seeing uh, a, a key problem amongst students in this data. However, when we looked at female students compared with uh, female non-students, there was indications in the data that female students might be experiencing an increase in anxiety and depression. Other sorts of um, uh, outputs that you can produce, this is uh, just a very simple descriptive report that we did, focusing in on the information that we have on uh, intellectual impairment in the sample. And we use that data to show, for example, that amongst people with lower levels of predicted verbal IQ, 
are much more likely to experience anxiety and depression than amongst people uh, with high levels of verbal IQ. And third sector organizations and lobbying groups like Money and Mental Health have also made use of data from the series. For example, in uh, this uh, policy briefing that they recently produced, which highlighted that problem debt is much more common amongst people with more severe common mental disorders. Okay, so before you start work, I recommend that you have a look at the this website, which is the mentalhealthsurveys.org site, and it's basically nothing fancy. It's just a repository of where. Uh, we put all the papers that we're aware of that have used the data. So if we avoid you replicating work that's gone on elsewhere. So in order to get hold of the data, um, the data up to APMS 2007 uh, is quite straightforward. You just go directly to the UK Data Service website. Um, you'll need to register or uh, log in. Um, if you're uh, based in an institution, you'll often have uh, an institutional uh, login uh, information. Now, there's a range of different types of um, access conditions. For open access, you don't even need to register. Um, end user license is the um, approach for accessing the uh, mental health surveys up to the 2007. Um, you will have an interface like this where all of the documentation and the reports, um, information about the derived variables, um, all available. And if you click on the right-hand side, um, there's information about how you can just immediately download the data. Now, for the more recent uh, surveys, post GDPR and other changes, uh, you have to first get approval from uh, the Data Access Request Service um, based at NHS Digital. So what you need to do is complete an application with them for permission to use the data. And once you've got that permission, then you can go to the UK Data Service and download the data in the usual way. Now that's about the specialist mental health surveys. I'm just going to say a few slides before we go on to own about understanding society, which of course is a longitudinal survey, absolutely huge longitudinal survey, initially started with something like 40,000 households. Um, of course, it also uh, draws on sample from the British Household Panel Survey, so there are um, individuals within the sample who have been followed up for over 25 years. Uh, sample members are interviewed every year, and there's a core set of questions that are asked uh, so you can look at change over time. And due to its very wide geographical coverage, uh, large sample size, and ethnic and immigrant boosts, um, lots of different subgroups can be studied and compared. Some of the key mental health and well-being indicators in the data set include the GHQ, uh, general Health Questionnaire, which is a really useful uh, summary measure. Uh, and the SF12 is also a really useful uh, measure, which includes both a physical and a mental health component. Uh, in terms of children, the strengths and difficulties is one of the key data sets for looking at mental disorders in children. Now, there's information in these slides, so you can um, use those links later on for finding uh, the different variables. And on the Understanding Society uh, website, there's also lots of information about training and webinars, and you can submit questions as well to the research team there. There's even a YouTube channel. I should check that out. I've not seen that. And again, so that you don't uh, duplicate work that's already uh, underway elsewhere, all the latest research and publications are also listed on that website. And you can sign up for uh, information um, and updates about Understanding Society using these links here. So that's me done. I'm now going to hand over to Owen, who's going to talk about the amazing first cohort studies. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you, Sally. Um, really, really um, interesting presentation. Really 
so much information there. Um, so what I'll be talking about, um, so Sally covered mainly the, the kind of cross-sectional uh, and, and specialist mental health surveys and obviously understanding society there towards the end. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the wealth of longitudinal data and, and longitudinal studies that have been conducted in the UK uh, with a particular focus on the British birth cohort, so a really useful data resource. Um, so quickly just run through what I will be talking about here. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, the actual studies that have been conducted, um, and the measures available, how to, how to find information about those, followed by uh, a brief overview of the British birth cohort studies um, and the kind of strengths of these uh, fantastic studies and the types of research questions that they are particularly useful for uh, answering. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about uh, a project I've been working on with colleagues uh, at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies in, in UCL um, about maximizing the comparability of, of mental health measures in the British birth cohort. So how can we uh, be sure that we're, we're measuring the same thing uh, across time and across different generations uh, in these studies? Uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up just with a little bit more about how to access these studies. So um, until very recently, uh, searching for information on all of the available mental health data resources or longitudinal uh, data resources in the UK was a bit of a chore. Uh, there's uh, an awful lot of studies out there, so researchers um, often find themselves uh, searching in isolation, having having to root through individual studies to find out that to find the, the data resources that can answer their questions. However, uh, if you click on the above or the below link, I should say, um, or scan the QR code provided here, you'll be taken to a fantastic new uh, data resource that has been launched just a few weeks back. Um, this is a comprehensive catalog of longitudinal and cohort studies in the UK with a particular focus on the mental health measures that are available to researchers. So this project was led by Louise uh, Arsenault at uh, King's College London, uh, Louise and uh, Bridget Bryan, both, both at King's College. Uh, this was a closer funded project and what they developed is, is essentially a comprehensive catalogue uh, containing information from a wide variety of longitudinal studies. So uh, I think there's about 47 um, studies in there at the moment, uh, moving up to, I think, there, there's potential for, for uh, nine or more uh, studies to be added. So it includes studies that uh, look at things like uh, birth cohort studies um, and other uh, longitudinal studies, uh, like household panel studies, like like understanding society and stuff like that 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 uh, uh, Sally already mentioned. So, if you follow this link, uh, you will find it provides a search engine for uh, finding information on mental health and well-being measures collected in the existing UK cohort and longitudinal studies. Um, it provides information about particular studies themselves, such as, for example, here the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, ELSA. So it will tell you things like uh, when the study commenced, uh, the geographic coverage, the, the types of, of measures that are collected, the sample details, uh, and, and the overall aims of the study. So lots of information about the actual studies themselves. Um, and very usefully, there is a, a tool for um, searching uh, detailed information or finding detailed information about mental health uh, and well-being measures, uh, including uh, individual items, uh, response scales, so sort of general um, screener questionnaires, more diagnostic um, focused interviews, um, uh, and all those different types of there's different methods of assessing mental health, so you can get um, lots of information there. It's a, it's a very easy to use website, very uh, user friendly. Uh, so, 
to discuss all of the studies that are included in the in the mental health catalog I just talked about would take far longer than 20 minutes um, so I'm going to focus my discussion on the um, British birth cohort studies um, so these are studies that, are, that have been um, essentially following the same individuals or groups of individuals uh, from birth uh, throughout their lives I'll be focusing specifically on those studies that are nationally representative. Um, we have uh, five uh, nationally representative cohort studies in the UK. Um, I, I don't believe sort of a, this type of, of data resource um, exists anywhere else in the world uh, and I think they can be very very powerful um, data resources uh, in answering questions not only about mental health but about other um, relevant health phenomena. So the first uh, study I'm going to briefly cover is the NSHD, the uh, National Survey of Health Health and Development, uh, which is the oldest of the British birth cohort studies. Um, it has uh, unique or it is unique in having data from birth uh, on the health and social circumstances of a of a nationally representative or a representative sample of uh, over 5,000 individuals uh, men and women born in uh, England Scotland uh, uh, or Wales in in March uh, 1946 and they've been they've had 25 data collection points um, over the participants lives so far so they're due to be surveyed again in next year when there will be roughly uh, aged around about 74 years of age. Uh, the next cohort study I'll talk about is the 1958 National Child Development Study. This again another nationally representative study follows the lives of over 7,000 uh, individuals who were born in England, Scotland and Wales in a single week in 1958. Um, so this represented 98% of the total births uh, across England, Scotland, Wales uh, in, that, in that week. Uh, and since then the cohort has been followed up um, 10 times. There have been 10 assessment waves for this data set. Uh, roughly uh, 12 years later, so uh, early on in the process of, of the British cohorts, the, a new cohort was, was launched roughly every decade or so. Um, so in 1970, the British cohort study, or BCS 70, uh, was launched. It follows, again, around about 17,000 uh, people who were born in England, Scotland, and Wales in a single week in 1970. And to, uh, to date, they've been followed up eight times. And the most recent wave has just been released uh, at age 46. Uh, next steps, uh, breaking from the, the, the traditional birth cohort mold here, um, it's formerly known as the Longitudinal Study of Young People in England. It's not strictly a birth cohort, uh, however it follows around about 16,000 uh, participants from uh, early adolescence in England. So uh, it began in 2004 when the cohort members were, were aged roughly 14, um, so it, it was uh, and, and sort of Efforts are now being made to retrospectively collect data from, from earlier waves. So what's unique about this cohort is it is um, linked to the National Pupil Database. Uh, database. So it has um, individual cohort member scores on the key stage two, three, uh, and four um, administrative uh, uh, key stage two, three, and four tests. So for individuals who are maybe interested in looking at mental health and, and education, it's a very uh, useful cohort. Um, more recently, or the, the, the most recent birth cohort study, the Millennium Cohort Study, um, is um, roughly uh, 19,500 children born um, over, a, over a roughly two year uh, period uh, September 2000 to, to January 2002. Uh, they've been followed up five times uh, with the next survey coming in uh, 2021 they'll be aged 17 years of age. So I've talked a lot about what surveys uh, are available and what's out there. What are the measures, what sort of information is, is collected in these surveys. Um, well, again, I mentioned briefly, these are not mental health specific surveys. These are, these are broader uh, data resources uh, for both the, the medical and social sciences. Um, but they, they collect uh, a range of useful uh, 
uh, information on, on a range of useful variables if you're interested in mental health. Uh, so across the cohorts, similar information uh, has been collected uh, from birth, things like uh, household composition, information about the parents' background, socioeconomic status, uh, uh, physical characteristics. Um, and also over time, different um, measures have been have been collected as individuals age, uh, including things like uh, mental health and well-being, also things like cognition um, and other physical measurements. So, what are the types of research questions that uh, are? Uh, particularly suited to this type of data. Uh, well, Sally covered the, the types of research questions we can ask with, with cross-sectional data or with um, repeated cross-sectional data. I guess the main advantage of uh, longitudinal data in general is that by having repeated measures, we can explore patterns of change uh, within individuals over time. So, for example, our, our mental health uh, are, are there certain trends or developmental uh, trajectories we can find? Um, this might help us identify key periods over the life course uh, for the onset and development of these difficulties. Um, also, given the wide range of information collected uh, on, on various other um, aspects of, of uh, life. Uh, we can explore the role of different uh, antecedents or risk factors. Uh, what are the things that maybe uh, influence the development of mental health or, or set people in motion on particular uh, developmental trajectories across their life? We can look at risk factors, not only fixed risk factors, things like uh, gender and, and things like that, that that don't change over time, but also dynamic uh, risk factors. So we can we can look at ask questions well are there particular changes in circumstances over time that can impact the, the mental health of individuals and finally given that these uh, these data are, are following uh, the same people over a very very long period of time um, we can get um, information on the consequences of mental ill health so um, not only in terms of things like uh, the continuity of mental health are, are, are people um, continuing to suffer mental health problems for a long time, but how does this impact other aspects of people's lives as they age? So that is really, if you're interested in those types of things, then uh, longitudinal studies, particularly the, the birth cohorts, are very useful um, in that regard. What are kind of met other methodological strengths of this type of uh, data? Um, well, again, I mentioned there's we can you know, they're not specialist mental health services. There's a lot of um, rich information on a variety of, of factors that we can control for. Uh, we can more accurately or more easily get at uh, temporal ordering because we have a we can have a temporal ordering built into the to the uh, nature of the design. Uh, the fact that we're ass assessing things prospectively reduces the, the risk of recall bias. We're not asking, for example, people to, to recall things from their own childhoods. We're using things like, for example, for mental health, we're using uh, maternal and teacher proxy reports of, of mental health. We can capture that when people are children. Um, uh, and also, uh, the, the particular cohorts that I mentioned today are also uh, nationally representative, so, um, so the, the findings can be generalized to the broader population. So, one of the, the unique things about the longitudinal studies in the UK is that uh, I, I'm not really aware of any other countries uh, in the world where we have such rich uh, birth cohort studies uh, ac staggered across different uh, periods of time. So this uh, affords us a kind of uh, unique opportunity to, to answer some very interesting research questions. So, okay, as I mentioned, the, the kind of main benefit of uh, longitudinal studies such as this is we can study uh, longitudinal development within uh, birth cohorts uh, over time. But the fact that we have, we have multiple birth cohorts and they're all nationally representative uh, allows us to look at cohort differences over time. So this gives us, this allows us the potential to potentially tease apart age effects are, for example, uh, in mental health, are there key periods um, of, of development that are kind of universal, it doesn't matter when you were born, um, or are there cohort effects, are there, are there you know, being born in, in particular points in time or in history, does this impact um, our mental health? And that's something that the, the cohorts are really well positioned to do. 
However, it's not necessarily straightforward, although uh, very potentially uh, powerful and impactful. Um, measures from different cohorts, they're not always directly comparable. Um, uh, Sally touched on this with, with the cross-sectional data. Um, so it's important to pay careful attention to the equivalence of, of measures. And I'm going to talk very briefly, if I think I only have a couple of minutes left here, about um, our attempts to, to maximize, I guess, the, the um, comparability of measures of mental health that are available in the British birth cohorts. Um, so this is a project I was working on um, with colleagues at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies uh, in, in UCL, led by Professor uh, George Plubidis. Um, and this uh, project was funded by Closer. And what we aimed to do was retrospectively harmonise the available measures of mental health in the British cohorts. In other words, um, We've been measuring uh, mental health using questionnaires in the, in the cohorts for a very, very long, for a very long time. Why can't we simply take, say, for example, a mean level of depression in adolescents in the in the 1946 cohort and compare it to a similar uh, cohort, for example, the Millennium Cohort Study? Uh, well, this project aimed to to maximise our ability to make valid comparisons across and within these cohorts. Um, so, for example, here are some examples of, of, of just the, the different ways in which we've um, assessed um, uh, mental health problems over the years. We can see there's different barriers to, to comparing different measures. So, uh, for example, different content of questionnaires, different symptoms were asked. Uh, these might have been reported on different scales across and, uh, and within cohorts, uh, and also different reporters. Uh, so, for example, in childhood, we typically use parent or teacher proxies, whereas in adulthood, we are more likely to use self-reports. Um, so, what we did, first of all, to deal with the issue of content, was even though you know lots of different questionnaires have been uh, administered over the years, uh, they, they might ask about different different types of symptoms and stuff like that. Um, a number of these questionnaires tap similar or, or common symptoms. So what we did is we had different two raters independently kind of screen all of the available questionnaires in the cohorts and identify. Um, common symptoms that are assessed within these cohorts, um, basically assigning a code of what's being assessed in each question. So here's an example from the GHQ uh, uh, 28 item version. We found that independent of one another, or two, the, the two raters rated uh, the first question felt constantly under strain as, as kind of reflecting tension or, or stress, something like that. This allowed us to develop a kind of schematic of all the common symptoms that are assessed across the different cohorts. Um, and this will, this will be made available for researchers to, to use. Uh, you might find, depending on the um, when exactly you're looking at, whether you're looking across cohorts or within cohorts or at certain developmental periods, you will have different permutations of common items. Um, and these we've created a searchable tool that can help you identify these. Uh, we also looked at the, to, it, uh, empirically test the uh, measurement equivalence of, of these measures and we have some guidance on how to do this. Um, I'll, I'm, I'm running short of time so I'll not bore anybody with uh, the technicalities of this. Um, but essentially what we try to do is test are we measuring um, say across cohorts or within cohorts over time, are we measuring the same constructs, uh, psychological distress for instance, and are we measuring this to are people interpreting the questions that, that we're using to measure this in similar ways. So all of this uh, information will be available uh, in the new year. Uh, we're, we're just in the final stages of publishing a uh, resource report on this uh, that will provide guidance for people and this will be available on the Closer uh, website in, in the new year. Uh, and just very, very briefly, uh, some examples of, of kind of capitalizing on this measurement work to make um, uh, reliable uh, comparisons. This is some of the work we're currently doing, looking at kind of trends in adolescent mental health in in adolescents, also trends in the in the development of adoles of uh, mental health in, in adulthood, and by kind of maximizing the comparability of these measures, we're minimizing the likelihood that any observed differences are are solely due to measurement error. In other words, we're we're more confident that we're seeing 
true differences both uh, within and across different cohorts over time. So very quickly, uh, before we move on to questions, uh, I will talk about uh, access. Um, again, most of this was uh, covered by, by Sally. There will be some uh, variation here uh, depending on the particular study you're interested in. Uh, most of the birth cohorts I've talked about today, the, particularly the 1958 cohort, the 1970 cohort, Next Steps and the Millennium cohorts are available, uh, freely available to researchers on the UK Data Service um, website. Uh, I believe uh, all of the mental health measures are covered under a standard uh, end user license. Other cohorts, uh, some of the more maybe region specific cohorts or for instance the, the uh, 1946 cohort, the, the MRC National uh, Survey of Health and Development and this is, this is housed at the uh, Unit for Lifelong Health and Aging at UCL. Uh, this is available again free of charge uh, to, to bona fide researchers who, who have uh, academic credentials um, and this can be accessed directly through the, the link I've included here today. So, so, um, yeah, thank you all for uh, listening to me. Uh, I believe now uh, I will pass you over to uh, Sarah, who has organized this, um, this uh, webinar, uh, and she will um, take some questions or, or, or put some questions to, to both myself and uh, Sally. So, thank you. That's great. Thanks, thanks very much, then. Um, so those, those were really good presentations. Um, we have um, thus far about six questions. Um, so we should have until uh, 3 o'clock to answer questions. So if anybody has a question they want to ask, um, do, do type them in now. If you can't see where to type them in, can you just go to, I think it's normally the top right um, of your screen, you should see a red box with a white arrow. And if you click on that, you should be able to see where you can um, type questions in. Okay, so the questions. Um, first one we had was from Emma or Amy, um, and it's, can you talk a little more um, at the end about the data access request service and when we need to ask for permission versus when we can use the data straight from the UK Data Service website? Um, I wonder if that's one for me to try and answer. Is that okay, Sally and Ewan? Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll just um, make myself a presenter then. So what I've done is I've gone to the UK Data Service website um, and I've typed in APMS and this has brought up the, the results. And what you'll see is that the top result there is the 2014 and it says it's the special license access version. And you'll see there's a 2007 version that doesn't say anything about what its um, license is. And if I wanted to see all of them, I would just click on the, the bit that says series here, and it brings up all the psychiatric morbidity studies. If I click on that, and then click on access data, and then on the title, you can see all of the different psychiatric morbidity surveys that are in this um, series. Okay, so to answer the question, um, this one, for example, the ones that before 2014, so 2017, 2007 one, sorry, that's available under the end user license, which means that you can just register with the UK Data Service and anybody can register. And then you would just go to the um, catalogue page, click on access data and add it to your account once registered. And then you can just download it straight off the website. So um, basically that, that goes for all of the ones before 2014 and I think that also applies to the ones that you were talking about, um, Owen. However, if I go back to the um, psychiatric morbidity studies and I go to one that says special license access, these are ones where you're going to need to get permission. So again, I will click on access data. And although it says you can add it to your account, in reality you're not going to be able to download this particular data set until you've got permission. And that means you should read the information that's here basically that explains um, what you need to do in order to get it. And I think that's, that's what Sally was referring to. Did you have anything to add to that, Sally? No, I thought that's a great, that's a great summary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, if you want to find, for example, the um, surveys that Owen was talking about, you would go to the data service website, go to get data, key data, 
you can also search using the search box at the front if you know the name of the particular survey that you're interested in. And this should take you to all the different kinds of surveys that we've got. These are just the key data, as I say. Some of them you can, if you can't find some of the key data, then you'll want to actually search for the data in the data catalogue. I've clicked on you longitudinal studies, and that's where you'll find links to most of the studies that Ellen was talking about. And again, I think with most of these, we're just talking about end user license, which means that you can just add it to your that one, say for example. So you've got all the information, all the documentation, and then click on access data, and you just add it to your account. Okay. Um, the important thing to remember is if it doesn't say what kind of license it is, then it means that you can just download it from the website after you've registered. Okay then, so another question from Sam. What is the most appropriate way to describe the one in four prevalence, please? This is referring, I think, to your slide, Sally. Yes. I've seen it reported yes. in different ways in the past, e.g. in any given year over a lifetime. Yes, yeah, so it's really interesting. The And this was something we kind of wanted to deconstruct a little bit because the one in four is such a ubiquitous figure. And we wanted to kind of understand, well, what is it that we mean? Because it's cited in all the government documents. It's, uh, it's used by MIND. It's used by many of the charities, the other organizations. So we just wanted to kind of tease it apart a bit using the, uh, the latest mental health survey data. And basically what we said is that, well, we found that the one in four is a useful summary measure, so long as we understand that it represents broadly a range of different types of disorders and it is quite inclusive in terms of its severity and that we would describe it as referring to people currently affected by mental health symptoms because um, whilst we did include uh, because of the, um, the measures that are used for the very rare conditions um, prevalence over the past year, what really drives the prevalence is um, anxiety and depression, and that was measured in terms of their uh, current current symptoms. So it's it's um, fine to say that about one in four of the population at any one point in time is likely to be experiencing um, uh, some kinds of mental health symptoms. Um, but so long as we understand that to mean a broad range of different types of disorders and quite an inclusive measure uh, in terms of its severity. Okay, excellent. Um, I see we've got quite a lot of questions now, so we'll um, we'll go through those. Um, so um, the catalogue mentalhealth.ac.uk site looks great. Thank you. This might seem like a silly question, but is this where we can get the actual questions on scales? For example, if I wanted to do a study that measured depression amongst university students who experienced risk factor, is this where I can I think find a validated measure scale of depression and can I use those questions in my study? That's from MA. I think that one's for Owen. Yeah, um, so I, I believe uh, that the catalogue will at least have uh, information as to the source of the questionnaire. Um, so if um, a researcher um, was interested in a particular measure and thought it was appropriate for a, a new study they were conducting, um, it would certainly point them in the in the right direction as to where to find um, uh, more information on that particular measure. But it wouldn't. I, I don't believe it has a direct download or or anything like that of, of the actual uh, questionnaire itself. Can you think of any data sets that might include variables around child abuse, corporal punishment, and adolescent aggression, cross-sectional or longitudinal? Um, well, I can just come in on the cross-sectional. So the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey does ask about, uh, retrospectively, about experience of both sexual and physical um, childhood abuse. And it also asks questions to enable um, diagnosis of conduct disorder. So this relates to getting into fights and bullying and things like that as a child. Now, of course, these are retrospective reports. So these are questions that are asked of adults about experiences that they had in childhood. Okay. Did you have anything to add, Erin? Yeah. So um, let me think. Uh, with more severe sort of variable things like, like child abuse, I, um, off the top of my head, I, I believe there is 
some questions, but they're they're retrospective. Um, I believe I think possibly the nineteen fifty. I would need to look in if if you give me the, the the person who asked this question. If you give me their email address, maybe I could look into that in a little bit more detail. Um, as for um, sort of adolescent uh, ag aggression, um, well the. SDQ, the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, um, very common measure of, of kind of uh, difficulties in, in children, includes um, a, a kind of uh, behavioral problem subscale, so things like uh, you know fighting, bullying, aggression, um, uh, and kind of uh, a hyperactivity scale. So that might be um, that's that's available in a, in a number of the, the longitudinal cohorts, uh, particularly ALSPAC and um, the Millennium Cohort Study, and they, they have multiple waves of SDQ data, so that might be something to look at. Okie dokie. Um, Musa asks, will we get emailed these slides? Um, I'll answer that. They're going to be here in news and events. If you go in there, you'll go to events, then past events, and the slides will be available probably later in the week. Okay, um, so Anne asks, in the data sets that were referred to within the webinar, are there questions that relate to drug use? It's difficult to compare data from mental health data sets and drug use data sets to look at questions around dual diagnosis. So from the perspective of the mental health surveys, yes, we, um, we both assessed, we got the audit and we got the severity of alcohol dependence measure. Um, and we also uh, assessed for uh, use of a range of different types of illicit drugs and also dependence. Um, so we've got five different um, types of signs of dependence on drugs. Um, so you can look at those things um, by presence of anxiety and depression and other types of mental disorder as well. And uh, yeah, I, I know there's information in the, in the Millennium Cohort Study, there's a lot of information um, uh, around um, uh, those sorts of behaviours. But uh, the, I believe the, the mental health catalogue would have, uh, again, a very good overview of what's uh, available in the longitudinal data sets. Okay. Um, Parisa asks, what are the nationally representative state-of-the-art and publicly available longitudinal studies of youth, adolescents on youth development, mental health behaviours? Um, thanks. Well, I think um, any of the, the studies um, that I covers there. Um, obviously with the more recent studies such as the Millennium Cohort study, we, we have um, a lot of information and, and some of the, the measures might be, be slightly more relevant. Um, again, as Sally mentioned, this is something that kind of changes with the time. We, 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 we don't, uh, our, our strategies for measuring things changes um, over time. But again, the, the harmonization project uh, that, that we're working on is should provide uh, guidance on kind of how to how to maximize comparability across cohorts if researchers are interested in, in looking at these things in, in nationally represented uh, representative cohorts uh, from from different um, decades. Great. Um, okay, Joe asks. Thanks to all. A question for Sally. I'd like to merge APMS survey results to create a larger sample size to analyze. Do you think there are any major reasons not to do this? A larger sample size will allow for interesting effect modification studies around gender, the local environment, and CMDS. I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, we've got um, we've produced weights specifically for merging 2007 and 2014 data. Um, in the survey reports, we use this approach for looking at um, low prevalence disorders uh, like autism and for psychosis, because otherwise we've got so few positive cases in the sample. So it is a bit of a, a management task, um, but once you've got your head around that, yes, it's a really good idea. Great. Uh, Bo asks, uh, is there any longitudinal data set that has free text of any kind by the participants? Um, I, off, off the top of my head, I know there is some free text uh, data in the uh, 1958 cohort. Um, I, I know um, Professor Alyssa Goodman at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies has been, been working on some um, research looking at the, the association, I believe, between 
um, letters to do with children's aspirations and, and their their actual uh, um, socioeconomic outcomes in adulthood, I believe. Um, so, so that's off the top of my head. That's all I, I, I'm aware of. But I believe there is uh, other examples of that out there. Great. Uh, so there's still a fair number of questions left. So are more training sessions on how to use the data, for example, APMS planned in future, Alfredaria? Um, so I think people are always welcome to email me if you've got a particular question um, about how to use the data. We do provide uh, quite detailed documentation which describes what variables to use for weighting and for controlling for complex survey design, um, things like that. Um, but yes, nothing specifically planned. I don't know if UK Data Service have got anything coming up. Not that I'm aware of about this, no. Hazel asks, are you aware of any data sets that ask both about mental health measures and measures of sexual risk taking? Um, I believe there, I believe uh, the Millennium Cohort Study has um, s some information um, on, on um, sexual behaviours, um, so that might be a, a cohort to look at uh, in, in the most recent sweep, certainly. Also, the 2014 uh, APMS, we included some questions on sexual risk taking, so um, uh, in particular numbers of partners without condom, and I think that's the main uh, in the last five years, in the last year. So um, uh, there's an opportunity to use uh, APMS 2014 to look at this, but it wasn't asked in the earlier APMS surveys. John asks, I believe the next MCS wave will include a self-completed version of the SDQ. What potential issues may arise from using both parent-completed and self-completed versions in a longitudinal study? Uh, well, that's, that's something we could um, test empirically. Uh, we, we could, uh, so at the, at the moment we're, we're doing something similar. We're working on a project where we're looking at uh, the, the kind of equivalence across teacher report and, and parent report. Um, there, there, I believe, is a lot of literature uh, out there about um, uh, sort of the, the invariance across uh, parent and um, uh, self reports. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's something we could we could sort of uh, address empirically and try and get an idea of how comparable those measures are. And MA asked. Do we need permission to use the cohort data if it includes questions around mental health? Uh, no, well? I will follow up. Uh, most of the the, men, uh, the cohort data, uh, the, the mental health um, data is the majority of it is uh, standard end user uh, license. It, it, it's again, it's only if you're looking to sort of uh, look at its association with, with more sensitive data, for example, uh, genetic data, educational data, or geographic data, that, that sort of thing. But the actual mental health data itself is very easily uh, accessed. Okay. Um, we have just uh, three more questions, so I think we'll just try and fit those in. So this is quite a long one from Lawrence. Um, I'm an enthusiast for secondary data sets and have used them including mental health. For sophisticated researchers who use multivariate analysis or decision trees, it's possible to disentangle the apparent effects on some outcome variable, e.g. physical health conditions of mental health and other variables which are associated with it, such as age, smoking, etc. However, there is a danger that crude users will merely do a mental health versus others analysis, which is actually misleading. Can you recommend any text which would help people to avoid the crude approach? I would make one comment, which is that this is a um, very pertinent observation when you want to look at causal relationships. But sometimes for government resourcing, for understanding, we simply need to know about prevalence in order to target groups. So it's not necessarily to say that uh, a particular characteristic is what drives a higher level of mental disorder, uh, but simply that people with a particular characteristic may well have a higher level of need. So it's, it's really just to say this is, I, I absolutely agree, and it's a very good point, um, but sometimes there is also value in that very simple descriptive approach. 
So it's a question, it's not really directly related, I don't think. It's how to prevent the situation that somebody who has used the same data as I download publishes similar results before my publication. So um, if, you're, that. If, you're, if you're planning on working with APMS, um, I'm aware of a lot of the uh, work that people who um, are doing that are working with APMS data. So we, we try to sort of keep a bit of a log. It's very informal. So, I mean, people can publish anything they like. There's no um, obligation to alert other people. Um, but you can, if you want to just email me, I can tell you if I'm aware of someone who's currently working on it. And the value of that is if there is someone else who's currently looking at the same thing, A, you may want to collaborate, so that you might want to uh, publish something together, or B, you might just want to um, focus your uh, analysis uh, slightly differently so that uh, you can avoid duplication in that way. But at, at the moment, it's, um, that is a risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, okay, for um, the cohort sorry. studies, um, again, it depends on, on the, the type of, uh, or who houses the data, essentially, for, for some of the more um, specialist cohort data sets, for example, the, the ALSPAC, the, the Avon cohort. Um, you know, they, they keep a very strict record of who's working on what, um, as do the, the, the 1946 cohort, other cohorts, um, I believe that that's, um, yeah, that, that could be could be an issue. Um, there, there's nothing to my knowledge that, that's incredibly systematic. Okay, great. And I think we've got through everything. Um, one final comment, which was just a compliment to say that this was a good webinar that was fuller and more informative than many other similar types of webinars. So there you go.